Good morning. Let's all stand. Last Sunday of the year. Can you believe that? Amazing. Everything that the Lord has done in 2018, it just, you know, comforts me and excites me for what he's going to do in 2019. And so let's go ahead and lift up this time. Father, we thank you so much for this morning as we begin to reflect, Lord, on what's uh, been going on this year, even with the many things, the many challenges that we face as a nation and in this world, one thing still always remains true, and that's your faithfulness, God, and the fact that we can take comfort in that and just know that no matter what, you're in control is what gives us the peace to wake up every morning and to rejoice. And so we ask that you bless our time as we lift up and as we sing to you and shout and celebrate another year. In Jesus' name.
now the silence breaks the bridge he shall reign forever he shall seated.
chosen by him. Amen? And as we sing these words, man, I feel so encouraged, right? Just to know that the God of the universe has chosen you and I to follow him and send his son. Let's go ahead and sing that part. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. Stories of what they think you're like, but I heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. Let's have you sing it out. You're a good.
Continue to worship. The ushers are going to come forth and receive this morning's tithes and offerings.
Laying yourself down Raising up the broken to life Let's all stand. back on this year, let's just take this time to tell him that we love him by singing out this song together. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to together one more time. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord. and I lift my voice to worship. so much because you first loved us and we thank you that throughout this year and throughout our life you've never left us and so as we can reflect on this past year and thank you for everything that has ensued no matter what happens around us Lord in this country around the world God we know that you never change we know that we could stand firm and have a peace knowing that our faith is in you and our foundation is set and strong. So as we begin to close out this year, Lord, may we reflect, may we be encouraged and just be stoked about 2019. We thank you so much for your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, why don't you turn around and greet someone different this time and you may be seated.
Hello Church Family, our Grief Share Support Group will be starting up again Monday, January 14th at 6.30pm in the Palm Room. If you are grieving the death of a loved one, come and experience God's comfort and healing as you go through one of life's more difficult journeys. If you know someone who is experiencing the loss of a loved one, please invite them. We'd love to come alongside them as well. If you'd like more information about our Grief Share sessions, you can pick up a brochure at the church office. God bless. Hello, Calvary Chapel of Habra. Just like to let you know that we're going to be having our first men's stake and study Tuesday, January 8th. We'd love to have you out. The cost on that will be $15. And we're going to be starting out our year of stake and studies. And so we'd love to have you come out and visit us. We'll be having a schedule out as soon as possible. God bless you. As I've been hearing around here, Happy New Year. The first study, I get it. They're a little like not yet awake. You guys have had your coffee way too much. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Oh, all right, all right. You awake? Good. When we're saying that, by the way, think of what we're saying as Christians. I hope you are happy next year. As we've learned around here, happiness is tied to a Latin word, happenstance. It's an emotion I feel when circumstances are going well. May the circumstances of your life go well next year. And may you have the right emotion, happiness. Christians, Christians are blessed. Christians experience joy. I think a good, I'm not going to, you know, bust anybody for saying it around here. Don't say that, you know. But may you have a blessed 2019. Amen? May we have a blessed 2019. And why don't we all stand up? And um, it's hot in here, isn't it? I'm going to turn on some AC for me. So you guys just keep standing there. Yeah, keep standing there. I have power right here. In the name of Jesus, right there. Okay. Let's turn our Bibles over to 1 Peter chapter. Two. Oh, let's make our way to verse 18. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable if because of conscience Toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer for it, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Speaking of Jesus, verse 22, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Speaking of Jesus, verse 24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Oh, Father, this, our final Sunday worship service in 2018, we thank you for the 51 other Sundays you've allowed us to gather and you've met us here and you've spoken to our hearts through your word. Holy Spirit, we give place yet on this this final Sunday, with 
a great sense of anticipation and appreciation because you have already been doing great things in our midst as we worship you, as we open up the living and errant eternal word of God to hear from you, you speak to us. You build us up, you equip us, you encourage us, you chasten us, you redirect us, you, you refine us, you mature our faith, you strengthen our faith. You save people in this room. You, you bring healing to marriages, family, and people in this room. We also know there's an audience that, that listens online live. We pray for them as we pray for us. And we ask you, we ask you to be our teacher to be our Savior. Lord, that we would leave here more in love with you. More in love with you. More convinced in who you are and what you do and more em embracing the plan that you have for us. And it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen and amen. Let's have a seat. Paul, once again, I guess we're actually in Peter, so we should refer to the right author. Peter, once again, <laughs> writing to Christians, Asia, minorish area, modern-day Turkey area, but Christians who were starting to face some real, real opposition, real persecution. He would begin his letter, as we've noted, that he would encourage them, reminding them of their significance in Christ, who they are as God's kids. A, a, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, he would say, his, his own special people, this holy set-apart nation of people. Indeed, they would need to hear those words of encouragement, but as such, they are to live out now who they are. And that, that then brings in the word witness. And he would begin then to, to talk about, yes, as the significant people of God, you need to also recognize there is the privilege of living that out, even in a very difficult time and season, very difficult circumstances. You are to conduct yourself honorable in verse 12 among the nonbelievers, the Gentiles there, and, and know that they're observing you, they're observing your witness. And as they would observe your good works, they would, they would glorify God as in the day of visitation. That, that, that God might even be recognized by them as they're observing you living out now who he is in your life. <laughs> your witness. Also, your witness as it relates to being submissive. And that's where he's going to go. He's going to talk about the importance of being submissive to human government. He's going to talk to slaves here about being submissive to their masters. We're going to give the, the equation of that today, or we're going to tie that in to employees and employers. And he's going to talk about submission in the home, submission in the marriage. Your witness is what, what he's focusing on. Your witness to, to the world around you. Your, your witness to the world that lives with you. Peter makes it very clear that as he writes to this particular people group, there were at this time, living in that day in the Roman Empire, slaves. There were some six million slaves living in the Roman Empire when Peter began to write this letter. Now listen, these slaves, when Peter begins to write, it was not so much just a racial thing. We've seen that in our history, as wrong as it was, as much of a, a tainted part of our history that it was, it was not so much a racial thing. There was, for the first, you know, years of slavery in the Roman Empire, there was, there was no Roman citizen that was a slave. But by the time Peter writes this letter, Roman citizens can now be a slave. 
how would one become a slave? Well, many, many were actually, they were spoils of war. They were defeated enemy and they were brought home to, to live within the Roman Empire once they were conquered and they were brought into the slave market. Any abandoned children were brought into the slave market. If you as a Roman citizen, or not so much a Roman citizen, had debts, there was something that, that, that needed to be resolved and you had no ability to pay that debt or to make that circumstance right, you could put yourself into a debtor's prison and you could be sold as, purchased as a slave. That person that would come to the debtor's market, the, 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 the slave market, he would, he would watch you be walked across a platform like this. They would probably get some highlights on, on your height, your weight, your abilities, and they would bid on you. They would purchase you. They would pay your debt. Now they would own you. Slaves could be bought and sold. You could be married as a slave, and your master had the right to take you as a married person and just merge you with another slave. It was difficult. It was, it was hard living for most slaves. There were the, the, the slaves that had very difficult masters, brutal masters. They lived the most humiliated, did the most menial tasks of society. Brutal, the galley slaves, it was brutal. Being chained to a Roman oar at the, at the hull of a Roman ship, and that was your life. But then there was a whole other demographic of slaves. They were educated. They were literate. The doctors throughout the Roman Empire were mostly slaves. Accountants, the educators, the teachers, a lot of the professionals. And they lived somewhat of a respectful life. There was no part of the Roman Empire that was not affected by, by slavery. The church itself was affected by slavery. In Acts chapter 6, there is a congregation of men that speak Greek that were called the freed men. They were ex-slaves. We know that, that there were some masters that were believers, we know that Philemon, the little letter in between Titus and Hebrews, Philemon was a master. And he had a slave by the name of Onesimus. And Onesimus had ran away. He, he had ran away, but before he ran away, he ripped off his boss. And he would go and find himself basically buddied up with this man by the name of Paul. And Paul would... Would, would lead Onesimus to the saving faith of Jesus Christ. And he would hear his story, and he would write a letter back to his master. And that letter really gives us, I believe, some insight onto the heart of Paul, onto the heart of even Peter, the believers, the church, and how it was affected by slavery, but, but how they were to view slavery. Paul would say to Philemon in that letter, listen, I've, I've got this one, I call him my son now because I've begotten him while in my chains. There was a time when he wasn't profitable for you, but I want you to know, man, I'm sending him back to you. I want you to receive him. I, I, I want you to understand that maybe he, he departed for this very reason. I know he left, he ripped you off, He's, you know, you're probably only thinking horrible things about him, but I want you to know he came to the saving faith of Jesus Christ, and now he's profitable for both of us. Paul basically goes, I don't even want to send him. I, I'd love to keep him, but I want to run it past you first. I want to make sure you see what I see. This is a good guy. He calls him a beloved brother, a partner. The slave that was living in the Roman Empire who was now impacted by the gospel being promoted through a follower of Jesus Christ. New Testament neither condemns nor condones slavery directly. The New Testament does not focus on reforming or restructuring human systems. 
The New Testament focuses on the heart of man, not the systems of man. And that is the area in which both Paul in his writings and Peter are concentrating. Nowhere in the the New Testament are these writers seen as calling Christians to go and and picket slavery and, and demanding that these slaves stand up for their rights and all of that, but they, 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 they encourage them to have the right attitude, listen, and to let God work through them right where they are. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 7, listen, if God grants you freedom as a slave, great, go for it. But if not, know that God can use you right where you are. You're every bit as able to obey and serve Christ and be a witness for Christ as a slave as you would a freed person. No circumstance, no matter how how terrible it might be, no matter how unjust it might be, can stop us or should stop us from being an avid follower of Jesus Christ and being his witness. So that kind of teaching began to affect other slaves and, and other masters, of course, where Christ's love is lived out unjust barriers and unjust relationships are inevitably going to break down to some degree. That's why Paul would later even write, there's the conviction of the church in the modern, what we know as Roman Empire, when slavery was completely accepted. He would say, listen, Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Aren't you glad that in Christ, the social distinctions and racial distinctions and, 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 and even the gender distinctions, it's all disappeared. Isn't that great? It's good stuff. No matter how different our differences were, we are now one in Jesus Christ. You should appreciate that. I'd never lose sight of that. As a result, Christianity made a radical impact on slavery in the Roman Empire In our day, in our age, as I said, we are no longer a nation that embraces slavery. It's a stain on our history. But both in the U.S., in Europe, just like in Paul's day, slavery was really broken apart by the life-changing power of the gospel in our land. It was the preaching, the spirit-filled preaching of men like John Wesley and George Whitfield that really made a difference in a nation and it began to to show what was right and face that which was wrong. It's true that where the gospel of Jesus Christ penetrates people's hearts on a wide scale, that the culture is transformed and the evils like slavery or poverty or oppression, they radically diminish. But these social changes are the result, not the goal of God's ultimate priority. God's ultimate priority is changing and transforming hearts and minds. So, writing to those living in that very difficult lifestyle, because it was very prevalent, six million Nearly half the population of the Roman Empire. Servants. Verse 18, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, (laughs) but also to the harsh. Be submissive, that speaks of obedience. Be obedient with all fear, that speaks of having the right attitude. You need to be respecting your master. Not only the, the good and gentle, And certainly, Christian masters should have been numbered in that, but also to the harsh. Harsh, the word in the Greek, scolios. Uh, We we get our our word scoliosis from that. it, it, It means to be bent, crooked. Even to these masters that are just, they're crooked guys. Many commentators, as you read their comments on the book of 1 Peter, will give a correlation. They'll give an application to the workplace. And I believe that it's a, 
a good thing to do because the principles fit. Employees are to obey their boss with the right attitude, respecting the boss's position, his authority, as well as the company that they work for. And that would apply to bosses that are good and gentle and bosses that are harsh. Admittingly, obeying authority in an unfair environment is a hard thing to bear. But Peter's exhortation makes sense when we connect it to the reasons that he gives us. The first one is found in verse 19 here where it says, for this is commendable. If you're a note taker, the word commendable means praiseworthy or noted by God. In the context, both work. For, for this is commendable. This is praiseworthy. Like God sees this. He takes note of this and is moved when you do this. But if because of conscience towards God, one endures grief and suffering wrongfully. It's noted by God as we go through the passage, you know that, that Peter is going to use Jesus as an example of suffering in a very unfair, unjust way, referring to the cross. But he's also going to talk about his response to that. And when our, our response is what God would have it to be. It's noted by God. It's noted by the Father. And just as we'll get to Jesus' proper response to unjust, unfair treatment. And it pleased the Father. So too, we, when we for the sake of God, for conscious sake, means as unto the Lord, as one would recognize this is the will of God, for conscience sake, as we will do that, God takes note, and he's like, you know what? You're just like my son, and that's praiseworthy. He recognizes that. Whenever we should do what we do, whatever we do what we do, it should be because of conscious toward God. That's obedience. And that's because God is both the origin and the goal of our obedience. So we take this into the workplace, and we can do whatever we do as unto the Lord. You work on a computer, whatever you do on that computer, you can do that as under the Lord. You're an accountant, you can do that as under the Lord. You work in the grocery store, as I did for several years when I was in high school and coming out of high school. Man, I never realized it then. I never really did it as under the Lord, but I look back at it, and I'm like, man, I blew those years. I could have done that as under the Lord. I did it for a paycheck. I did it for a position. I did it to move up. I didn't, you know, I did it for all the wrong reasons. I own my own business. I've started a couple of my own businesses. And, and many years in, in that, in the throes of all of that, I, I did it without this conviction. No matter what you do, no matter what I do, we can do it as unto the Lord. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And he breaks it down in verse 20. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? And Peter's like, listen, you know, there's no credit occurring for enduring punishment. If you're de you've done something wrong, you kind of deserved that, okay? You had it coming. But when you do good, you know, you're innocent. You suffer if you take it patiently. You know, it's commendable before the Lord. It is respectful submission to undeserved suffering that finds favor with God because such behavior demonstrates his grace. A slave needed to look at enduring, unjust, unfair situations 
in their life as, as ministry. They, they needed to look at submitting to a master, whether good or harsh, as ministry, as an opportunity to demonstrate God's grace. In the workplace, if the occasion exists, if the situation arises, a Christian as an employee needs to look at enduring personal injustice in an unfair situation as ministry as well. They, they need to look at submitting to a boss, whether good or harsh, as ministry, as an opportunity to demonstrate God's grace. I know we call it work, but it is ministry. And we all are going to work. It's part of the curse. It just is. You got a problem with it? Take it up with Adam. Get in that long 200,000 year line that will form by people that want to talk to Adam. It'll be in heaven. But the curse was from this time forward. You're gonna, it's just going to be different. You were just, I provided everything for you. <laughs> now the ground is cursed. You're going to work by the sweat of your brow. You are going to work. Some people have a privilege of working, doing something they love. Not most, but some. And that's great. But either way, whether you love it or you don't, that's what it is. It's, it's work. But I want you to know whether whatever you do, whatever I do, we can look at that as ministry, an opportunity to be a dispenser of God's grace. If you're a construction worker and you're hammering nails for a living, <laughs> you can you, you could look at that and, and, and see that as just as significant as me standing behind this pulpit and hammering this point home. In God's eyes, it's just as important. The opportunity is just as great to be a dispenser of his grace. A big part of, of ministry is helping people find Jesus Christ. Helping people find Jesus Christ. And, and, and it's not so much, I believe, what we say as it is the way we live out what we believe. It was at Jesus' baptism in Matthew chapter 3 where the Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove. The Father echoes from the heavens. Behold, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Many scholars have taken note that the Father was saying that about his Son before he ever performed a miracle, before he ever taught the crowds, before he did what we see as his three and a half years of ministry. <laughs> so what could he have taken note of? The obedience of his Son going and platforming baptism and all that. Absolutely, it could have been that. But could it also have been Wow, I'm looking at my son, and he's living the life that I've called him to live. It's called submission. That's called obedience. I'm looking at, at, at who he is in this home under the parents of Joseph and Mary. I'm pleased. I'm looking at him as a, as a, as a, as a sibling, and, and I, I, I'm thinking about who he was to James and Joseph and and, and, and Joseph, excuse me, and, and Simon and Judas and the sisters as Jesus' siblings are named in Matthew chapter 13. Yeah, his witness, who he was. And the father would go, I'm just pleased. Oh, as an employee under his father in the family business as a carpenter, I'm pleased. He was living his life with a conscience toward God, and the Father was pleased. 21, for, for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. So we talked about the reasons Peter gives us for submitting in unfair and difficult situations. Number one, we, we noted that it is commendable to God. It pleases God. It's praiseworthy. It's like, hey, here, you're like my son. Secondly, here, because 
It's modeled by Jesus, and we are to follow his example. For, for to this you were called. Another translation says, for you have been called for this purpose. What is the purpose? Suffering for doing good. Christians are called, it's eklathete in the Greek, it's, uh, it speaks of emulating. Emulating, we are called, we are, we are to emulate his character and his conduct. In chapter 1 of verse 15, we are to emulate, same word is used. It says, as he who called you, same word, as he has called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. So we are called to follow his example of holiness there, and now we are called to follow his example of submission in an unfair situation, a time of suffering. Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. In the Greek, again, a, a, a hypogrammon. It's an underwriting. It's, it refers to a, redder, a letter excuse me, written by or drawn up by a student that is reproducing something. We are to reproduce the life of Christ that we have seen modeled before us. And nobody has ever suffered as unjustly as Jesus. He is and was the perfect man. But as he talked, we, we, we would see throughout the Gospels, he was often misunderstood. To the people he preached, many would challenge him. He was maligned by his enemies. He was forsaken by his family. He was betrayed by his friends. He was abandoned by his disciples. He was completely tortured by law enforcers and ultimately executed by politicians. He was that perfect man that was treated that unfair and that unjust, that cruel, the beloved of the Father. He was at the center of the Father's will, and he suffered. There are times, I know all of us as Christians, if you've walked for the Lord for any amount of time and, and something unfair, something unjust happens in your life, you kind of go back to, but God, I've been, and you remind of how much you love him and all the wonderful things you've done for him and how you're in the center of his will. How can this happen? The beloved son in the center of of the Father's will, was treated as the most despicable, vile, horrific person. But he was innocent. He was sinless. Verse 22, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Peter's quoting a portion of Isaiah chapter 53 where it's a prophecy about the Messiah and, and how he would respond during his death. In this passage, Peter is taking us to the most extreme example of unjust suffering, the innocent Messiah being crucified. I was taken to Isaiah 53. I just wrote a few words that just kind of stood out here. Um, he's a man of sorrow. He's a man of grief. He was stricken. He was smitten. He was afflicted. He was wounded, he was bruised, he was chastised, he, he has stripes laid on him. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter, he was slaughtered, he was cut off from the land of the living. They put him to death. At the very end of that it says, nor was any deceit found in his Wow. Peter puts the example of suffering unjustly before us, and he puts the spotlight on three important facts. Whether this applies to the workplace, the home place, another place, who are we to be? What is our witness to be? 
in an unfair, unjust situation. Number one, he said already, 22, Jesus committed no sin, either before, during, or after his suffering. We know he was sinless. What is he really saying that for? <laughs> well, this points to the extent of the injustice he endured. He did nothing wrong. He was sinless. Neither was there deceit found in his mouth. Not one treacherous word was spoken towards those who were treating him unjustly. My goodness. <laughs> I was at a store recently. There's a Swedish lady checking out stuff. It was Home Depot. She had extra stars, whatever they put, buttons on all the stuff. I could tell she's done some stuff. She's a good employee. I try and find her line every time I go there. Sweet lady, nice lady. But I was about four back in her line, and there was a guy in the front, and, 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 and he, he basically was in the wrong line. Not that he was in that line. He was supposed to be over in the construction area. This is a commercial account that he was trying to get, you know, handled at the wrong counter. And so, you know, she just kindly said, hold, hold on, sir, I can't do that on my register. And, and if you just go over here, and she just kind of, we put you right at the front of the line over here at this, you know, just, just handle herself so right. And I was like, yes, that's so, man, man, props, props. And this guy wouldn't have it. He says, no, 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 you will, you will. He began to be very American cultured. You see, we, we demand our rights these days. It's all about me, and he began to demand his rights. You will ring me up on this register. We will. She goes, I, sir, I, I just can't. And he got red-faced. He raised his voice. And he began to, to, to say, this is prejudice. And I'm like, can I just say, it? dude, you're white, she's white. What's prejudice? What the, where are we going with this? Next thing you're going to say, you're a girl. Where are we going with this thing? Filling my feminine side today. What the, where are we going? Come on, snap out of it. I'm going to tell you something. She was catching the, the, the brunt of, of this unjust behavior. I just happened to be in line. I wanted to knock the guy out. <laughs> my ears were getting red. Is that okay to say? Are you guys okay with that? I wouldn't do it. I didn't do it. Okay, some of you are like, did you hit him? Finish the story. You're going to come up to me outside. Did you hit him? No. I grieve for him. I grieve for him. The disrespect. That was sin. That was sin. There was deceit in his mouth. This was vile. It was dark. I could feel it. As I look at this, I, I, I look at the example, the model of Jesus. I, oh, man, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Verse 23, he did not retaliate. He, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Think, think of, you know, there's certain people in life, you know, you, you don't want to mess with them. You just don't want to mess with them. There's, there's, there's some really proud people that really think they are above everybody, but one day they're going to meet their match. You know what I'm saying? They're gonna, they're, that guy one day is going to get whacked. You're not going to have Lance Cook in a line behind him. He's going to have, like, Mike Tyson in line behind him. He's a whack. You'll meet your match. Think of the match the Roman soldiers could have met. They're crucifying God. They're crucifying the Son of God. Think of what God could have done when someone he loved, his son, was being treated so unjustly. Think of what he could have done. Think of what Jesus could have done. He didn't retaliate. 
he didn't even make any threats. Humanly speaking, the, the provocation to retaliate during the arrest alone, during the unjust trials, during the scourging, the crucifixion, it was extreme. Yet he remained silent. He did not retaliate. What an example. The most extreme example of one being treated unfairly, unjustly, cruelly, and suffering. We go back to the account, and we see words like this coming out of his mouth. As they were nailing him on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Oh, that's your example. That's my example. And, 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 and he, he didn't threaten he didn't threaten. You want to mess with me? <laughs> Let me tell you what you're going to get. No, he, he didn't threaten. He completely committed himself to him who judges righteously. Father, you got this. I trust you with the final word on this. Thus, he could endure injustice with hope. He knew his father had his back. He knew there's a purpose, and he he had entrusted himself to him. Similarly, we can entrust our lives and unjust circumstances to God who also judges righteously on our behalf. By following the example of Christ, we can secure an unshakable hope in difficult times. Pastor Chuck, one time here, he was speaking in the green room. I was just throwing questions at him and I forget how we got on the subject, but he just made this statement. He's like, Lance, God will allow you to defend yourself if you want to. I'm like, oh. And he really boiled it down. Who, who can defend you better, you or God? The three of you that agree with me, praise God for you. I really thank God for you. You can come back to church next week. The rest, <laughs> I don't know. 2019, wake up. Okay. Who can defend you better, you or God? God. Oh, 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 okay. Romans 12, 19 and 20. Behold, beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you're going to heap coals of fire upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil. I'm going to read that again. 21. Do not be overcome. Don't succumb to it. Don't be overcome by it. But overcome evil, God's kids, with good. And that's Jesus. We are living in a day with such rapid deterioration of Christian values that, you know, we are more likely than ever to suffer mistreatment in our places of employment, not because we say we're Christians, not because we have that title, but because of our commitment to Christ. The temptation to defend ourselves, the temptation to respond with treacherous words or retaliate, that temptation can be very real. And we are living in a world whose message is to stand up for your personal rights. But God also has a message. And may his voice always be louder than the voices of society. Amen? And we have been called to a higher standard. We need to endure whatever comes our way for the cause of Christ, for the greater good of his kingdom. This passage brings us to ask ourselves some really heartfelt questions. Number one, how have we reacted as Christians to unfair treatment? How have we, have we reacted to unfair treatment? Did we strike back? Did we retaliate or look for, you know, ways to revenge, get revenge? How would unbelievers perceive Christians and Christianity because of how I reacted? Question. 
When did I last take it on the chin for the cause of Christ? When did I last surrender my rights for the deliberate purpose of following Christ's example? We know this is difficult, especially in our our fight back, demand your rights, get even culture. We know this kind of an attitude does not flow from us naturally, so we must understand that that this is going to take God's help. God's never going to call us to do something without giving us the grace to do it. Philippians 2, 13, 12 and 13, you know, Paul says, you know, we need to be, as, as we have obeyed in his presence in now and in absence, we need to be working out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And then he says this, and this is what I want to hone in. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So God has called us to obedience in this area. God calls us to obey, and then through his his divine power, when we step out in faith to obey, he empowers our obedience. (laughs) It's both to will and to do for his good pleasure. To to will, the word fellow in the Greek, it refers to thoughtful, purposeful choosing. I, I, I think and I purpose in my mind, yes, I'm thinking through this, I choose to obey God God even gives us the desire for his will. And then he gives us the power to obey. That's a good deal, don't you think? That's a great deal. Anyone can fight back. It takes a spirit-filled Christian to submit and to entrust God with their battles as the one who, who will ultimately judge right. Jesus said, here we go, we're going a little bit deeper, get ready, buckle down. Matthew 5, 38, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. And whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. That's speaking of authority. If a Roman soldier went, hey, carry this for me. Walk with me. I want you to go a mile. He says, just be willing to keep going. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, don't be turning away. More heart-to-heart questions. How, How does this teaching apply to my everyday situations in life? How might unbelievers perceive Christians and Christianity if I lived this out. Instead of meeting the world's slap in the face with a punch in the gut, I'm told to turn the other cheek. How is that lived out? And how will that affect the world I am living in today? If slaves could apply these principles to their lives personally, as unto God, and it began to change the culture and diminish slavery. What could happen today with you and I in the workplace? When we submit to the lordship of a perfect leader who has set an example of surrender, he will meet us there. He will empower us. He will help us. And he'll deal with the injustice and the unjust ones. Verse 24, as we wind this down, Jesus did all of this, not for himself, but for us, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. This is a very, very, very wake up and listen important point. Don't miss it. If God can work Calvary for the good, he can take the unjust situations in our life and work them for the good. Hear me again. If God could take the situation of his innocent son being brutally tried, scourged, crucified, 
and work it for the good. He can take the unfair, unjust situations of my life and do the same. Okay? Did you grab that? That's huge. That's, that's huge. Think of the good that has come to your life alone because Jesus was sinless and didn't revile and didn't threaten, but just submitted to the Father's plan to that unjust, cruel punishment of the cross. Think of the good that came to your life, my life, to the countless lives. Understand that Peter is taking us somewhere here. I close with this thought. He, 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 he wants, you know, th- th- this applies, he applies this whole thing of submission, our witness and submission to human governments. He, 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 he now has done it to the workplace. And he's going to do it in marriage and the home. Peter is not just giving some cheap advice. No. He is sharing his heart. He is sharing what he himself has followed. Peter, at the close of his life, will be brought into the Mamertine prison. Many secular historians write about the Apostle Peter in the Mamertine prison. Factual writings that we can read. Peter, this man who's like, hey, submit in in settings when it's unfair, unjust. The follower of God, a worshiper of God, a proclaimer of Christ, a leader in the church, incarcerated, secular historians tell us, for the first nine months, first nine months, Peter was not allowed to lay down. He was chained upward, not allowed to lay down. Don't let me lay down for about two days. you got a cranky lance. But listen, these unjust people, the very ones that would not allow him to lay down, the guards, somehow, somehow, so he's not just giving cheap advice, somehow the love of God worked through that man that was treated unjustly for those nine months. And 47 of the guards converted to Christianity. That's secular historians telling us that. Hmm. Peter is at a point in his life where this stuff is just flowing out from his heart. You see, for Peter to die, he knew his death was coming and he knew how he would die. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Jesus meets him on the shores of Galilee and After Peter swims in, they have some breakfast. Jesus pulls him off to the side and says, Peter, do you love me? Yeah, you know I love you. Feed my lambs. Oh, okay. Second time, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Tend my sheep. Third time, do you love me? You deny me three times? I need to hear it three times. Do you love me? Lord, you know I do. You know all things. Feed my sheep. And then he says this. I want to read it. Most assuredly, Peter, I say to you that when you were younger, you girded yourself and you walked where you wished. But but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. And another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. John says this Jesus spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. Listen, listen, listen. It's at that point that Jesus, telling him, listen, Peter, you're going to be crucified, bro. 
They're going to, you've had freedom to come and go as you wish. That's going to be taken from you. They're going to gird you. This is how you're going to die. He just witnessed Jesus being crucified. This is how you're going to die. Eeks. Then he says this, follow me. Read it. Follow me. Follow me. And he did. I, I, I don't think Peter flinched when they arrested him and took him into the Mamertine prison. I don't, I, I don't. I don't think he flinched. He would die a martyrous death. They would take his wife and kill him, her in front of him first. And they would take Peter and they'd say, you're done. And he would have one request. Just crucify me upside down. I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. He didn't flinch. Why? Listen. Why? Because... Peter, that would flinch. Peter, that would, would defile. Peter, that would retaliate. Peter, that would fight back. Remember that Peter? He died. He died with Christ. As Paul would say, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I. Paul the Pharisee. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. The life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Peter is not giving cheap advice. Peter is talking from the well of, 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 of real life experience, of walking with Jesus Christ himself and saying, you can do this. You can do this. Then he closes this portion of the letter with this deep focus on, on Jesus that we just, we just can't miss it. 24 again, let me read it. Who himself bore our sins in his body, own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. He's like, listen. And I, I want you to think of what it was like for Peter to write now about the crucifixion. Think of what it was like for him. He walked through each step from the arrest to the trials to the scourging. Distance, watching. And denied through the process who Jesus was. And now I don't know him. Now, later on, Jesus finds him restores the relationship with him, calls him into ministry. He's effective as a church leader. Think of what it was like for him to, to write about the cross. Oh, oh, yeah. In his own body, he bore our sins. Yeah. Not another man. This is not a human anything. This is the Son of God. And, and he did it with a purpose in mind, that we might live for righteousness. What's he talking about? When a person puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, be, be, before that, they're not righteous. They're born not righteous. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're, we're born sinners in an unrighteous station before God. We are not in right standing with God. But the moment we put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ, we then are robed in his righteousness. We become, well, we're in right standing with God. Let's all stand. I want to I close this while you guys are all alert. This is important. Some of you are showing me your eyelids. I'm going to be looking at your eyelids. What would you do if I start? You'd be like, dude. Chop, chop. All right. You guys with me? Righteousness. It's huge. Big word. Huge word. Let me tell you who's in heaven right now. Those that found right standing with God on earth. Let me tell you those who are in hell right now. Those who didn't, and they died. He produces this righteousness this right standing with God. But what he's saying is, listen, he, he's died 
so that we can die to sins and live for righteousness. He's talking about the life that we are to live out now as followers of Christ. Listen, Peter's saying this. Look, I, I know it's a challenge to go and, and submit as unto the Lord in unfair, unjust situations. But it's commendable to God. Oh, and by the way, his son died so you might put faith in him so he might produce this through you. That's what he's saying. He saved us not just to be our Savior. He saved us to also be our Lord. Our Lord. By whose stripes you were healed. And that's talking about the healing of the soul. It's talking about salvation. For you were like sheep going astray. But have now returned. You were. Sheep, sorry, are dumb. And they got... Man, they got a, a will in them. I, I just want, I want to go my way. I want to go this. He goes, you were that. But now you've returned to the shepherd and the overseers of your souls. I had someone here recently speaking, and they said, dude, there's a lot of people here, man. Yeah, there's a few. He says, you know, how, how, how do you handle all that responsibility? I got a, a little bit of a smaller work, and, and, and it's a lot of load. And, and, and I says, it's, it's simple. Not in the sense of simple, but you know what I mean. The answer is simple. I am an under-shepherd of the supreme shepherd. And I am absolutely just one of you under him. And he is a caretaker of our soul. I says, my job is just I point them to him. He does a great job with souls. He saves them and he directs them. So you go to work. You find yourself in a very difficult, unfair, unjust situation. What do you do? Who do you call? Not me. <laughs> I've pointed you to the one. That you must call. He, the shepherd of your soul, will guide you even in that unfair, unjust situation. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the directness of 1 Peter. We need it. Thank you for the example of your son, Jesus. We need it. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit, for the assistance of you, our God, and the, the power that we have to allow us to be obedient, to be submissive, to be witnesses in a way that would bring glory to you. And I would pray, Father, in these closing moments as we would sing and close out our day that if there are any here that would need to accept you, both here or on the internet, that they would, they would do that even now by recognizing before you they are a sinner, by asking you to come into their life and to save them. And to those, Father, we pray you would fill with your spirit. And may we have a chance to walk with them as God's kids. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless your 2019. Wow, what a message. 2018 and to go into 2018 with uh, just a, a renewed mind on authority. Wow, God's good. He knows what we need. So um, happy new year. We'll see you guys in 2019. And just want to give you a couple reminders. Uh, men's. Uh, stake and study. It's only a week and a half, even though it's in 2019. A week and a half, sign up, uh, get that going. Um, also, mentoring moms will beginning will begin 
in January. If you guys want to know anything more about that, go to the Resource Center if you guys need prayer for anything, especially if you guys accept the Lord. Uh, come forward. Our prayer ministry will be up front. So God bless you guys. Bless you. Have a wonderful day.